Welcome to this joint Who is Voting in 2024 and What Matters Today podcast episode. I'm Dan Graham, Head of Communications at the Geneva Graduate Institute, and I'm the host of this episode today. Just a quick word about both of these series. Who is Voting in 2024 is a series produced by the Geneva Graduate Institute's Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy, focusing on the multiple elections taking place in 2024. And What Matters Today, which is produced by the Institute's Communications Department, is a current affairs podcast series featuring Geneva Graduate Institute faculty and international experts commenting on the most pressing global issues. This episode focuses on the current elections in India. The voting process has started in what is the world's largest election. The Chief Election Commissioner Rajiv Kumar recently stated, It is our promise to deliver a national election in a manner that we remain a beacon for democracy around the world. Much of the focus, at least in the Western media, has been on the near certainty of Narendra Modi being re-elected. So we are here to discuss what is actually at stake in these elections for India and the world, and how things have really shaped up on the campaign trail. My guests today are Mukalika Banerjee and Gopalan Balachandran. Gopalan is the co-director of the Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy and a professor of international history and politics at the Geneva Graduate Institute. His areas of expertise include globalization, emerging countries, and diasporas, among others. So first, I want to thank both of you for being here for this conversation. Very excited to have you joining this episode. We'll start with Mukalika. Please tell us what is at stake with these elections for India and the world. This is a quite extraordinary election. It's unlike any election that India has had, because as people have begun to say, it really is the constitution of India at stake, it's the future of the Indian Republic at stake, because here we don't just have competing parties trying to win an election. We have a party, the dominant, the incumbent party in government at the moment, that has made it quite plain that if they were to come back with a large majority, the entire vision of India as it has been constituted Uh, since 1950, is likely to be threatened. Now, the Republic has already been under threat in the last 10 years under the BJP government. A number of civic freedoms have gone away. Independence of the media no longer exists. Activists, journalists, opposition politicians have been jailed. And worst of all, public institutions like the Election Commission of India have lost their neutrality. So there has been a real assault on some of the key features, the DNA of what we know India to be, because there is an ideological project behind that political party. It is to reimagine India as a Hindu majoritarian state. And this is according to their own ideology and as they would articulate it themselves. So this has been an ongoing project for the last 10 years. The next term, if this government were to come back in power, and especially with a big majority, there won't be any safeguards against their altering of the constitution, then really we are going to see a very different India emerge. So that's at stake. So the people who are fighting the BJP in these electoral contests all over India in the 543 seats are fighting not just to win power, they're fighting to defend a certain imagination of India that is under threat. And Bala, what would you like to add? I should add the future of India as a federal arrangement could also be at a challenge. India is not a unitary republic in the strict sense, nor is it strictly a federal republic. It's a messy compromise, and it's a messy ongoing compromise that is renewed from time to time. And uh, one of the trends we've been seeing, particularly over the last five years, is uh, the rights of states or their constitutional uh, rights, so to speak, being uh, circumscribed, certainly. Measures like certain kinds of taxes, for instance, the reallocation of revenues between centers and states, these have now become open to negotiation in a form that didn't exist before. And if you add to that the growing power of the central agencies, then we are probably in for a rough ride as far as the federal arrangements in India might be concerned. And just to add to that, India is a very 
divided country when you look at its different economies, the federal structure that Bala is talking about. There are certain states, especially the ones in the South and the West, who are growing far more rapidly, whose human development indicators are much better, they have better state capacity and so on. And when there is this kind of inequality emerging in, in the federal compact, there is now often mention of balkanization, which is terrifying when you think about the entity of India. So there is that at stake. Thank you for those answers. Now, let's talk about the campaign itself, which has been running for a few weeks now. Are these elections turning out to be a referendum on Modi, who's been leading India for the last 10 years, or have other issues come to fore? It certainly was pitched by the BJP as, as Modi's election, and not just 2024, every single election is Modi's election, right? Even when they're provincial elections, the chief ministerial candidate who is going to run the state has not announced. It's Mr. Modi, whose face is everywhere. So in a sense, this is a construction of the BJP themselves that it's always a referendum on Mr. Modi. And so far it has worked because he's a leader that millions of people clearly vote for. Right. And he is very popular. So yes, it is a referendum on Mr. Modi and the 10-year record that any incumbent government needs to defend. It began with a lot of bluster, and the big slogan was, we're going to cross 400 seats out of the 543, which is an enormous majority. But that was the brag, that no problem, but that's how it's going to play out. I dare say in the last few weeks, that picture has begun to alter uh, a lot more. So now there are questions being asked about the 400 par, as they said in Hindi, that char sopar, that slogan has been dropped very quickly because very soon into the campaign, they realized that was not happening. Now the questions that are being raised is whether they would even get the majority of 272 on their own. Are they going to need their allies? Are they going to get the majority with their allies? Uh, those are the kind of questions that are coming up. Right, right. Okay, thank you for that. And Bala, how are the economic factors playing out? I guess one of the reasons we are seeing the campaign trail unfolding, as uh, Mukulika just described, is perhaps this sense within India that uh, the Indian economic success story is not exactly what it is made out to be here. I was astonished by how the Western media had totally prized in Modi's victory on uh, things based like the headline growth numbers, projections of 7, 7.2%, to some extent, there have also been the government's uh, welfare schemes, which actually go back uh, quite a number of years before Modi, but which, according to a lot of people, are being administered a lot more efficiently with fewer leakages, but also in a way that ties the beneficiaries directly to the government. That said, it's really not solving the biggest problem that many people seem to be facing, which is that of unemployment, especially amongst the youth. One big blow to the Indian economy was back in 2016, I think, when the, you know, rupee, the, the big currency notes were demonetized. So India moves to a system of electronic transfers, which basically disadvantages small enterprises and so on. And there's been a tax reform, which is added to that. Mukulika has just been back from some of those uh, places and she's doing research on this. And it'd be great to hear your take on it. Yeah, the GST, the goods and services tax, which is a terrific tax. It, it basically turns all of India into a free trade zone, as it should be. So it should ease business enormously, because there was a whole cluster of different indirect taxes earlier, which made doing business across India hellish. And that was replaced by a single tax. But the way in which, the manner in which it was rolled out was so rushed. It was a classic, Bala just mentioned demonetization. GST, the introduction of GST was done in a similar midnight hour announcement, which Prime Minister Modi is uh, very fond of doing, taking the whole country by surprise, announcing lockdown with four hours notice. And people don't know what to do, but, you know, hey, it's done. That's seen to be decisive leadership. And the impact of that has been that especially small and micro businesses have struggled really badly. And many of them in certain parts of India have simply exited mm -hmm. the economy. So there seems to be, whether by design or 
and unintended consequence has been that a lot of the smaller enterprises in India have closed down. It has definitely favoured larger businesses and corporate houses and so on. And we have to see this in the context of a country where 1% of the population owns 40% of the wealth. The social inequalities in India is higher than the US, South Africa, Brazil. I mean, it, it's been growing. And this is what Bala was saying, that you can have these headline figures of economic growth figures, but they're not definitely not generating employment. 50% of India's population is below the age of 25. We need jobs. You can have growth figures, but if it's not actually translating into people's lives getting any better, which it certainly isn't. And so the GST has also rolled out in this larger context. So the economic distress of large parts of India is quite acute and people are finding their voice and they're talking about it. And it really astonished me, actually, because it, in the past economic issues, people may talk about inflation or what we say in Hindi, mahengai, which is things just getting very expensive, which is not the same thing. But people feel that pinch. But this, for the first time, we heard GST concerns. You know, actually in Tamil Nadu, where we were doing our research, part of our research, they were making representations to candidates from each of the political parties saying, you've got to deal with this issue. It was really startling that redistribution and welfare and what it actually means to provide welfare has become a huge campaign issue in partly because the Congress put it into its manifesto and also because it was then broadcast as a set of complete misrepresentations of what the Congress was proposing to do and that kind of snowballed into this huge debate of, oh, they're going to take all your money away. It was the equivalent of they're going to take the wedding rings off women's fingers and give it to the poor. And if you're rich, beware of this alternative government. So redistribution, welfare, economic distress, taxation, the fact that corporate taxes have been slashed from 30% to 22% at a time when the country needs the money. All of these have become big campaign issues. I'd just like to ask a follow-up question, if I may, on because you said something extremely interesting about the disparities and youth. And I'm just wondering, how are the parties trying to attract youth? What is the pitch they are saying to youth right now? If they want jobs, are they promising jobs? Are they promising a better economic future? And if so, how? Mr. Modi said he has a thousand-year vision for India. Yeah, not 100, not 200,000 years. By 2047, which will be the 100th anniversary of Indian independence, mm -hmm. India is going to be, I don't know, the biggest country in the world or something. Or a developed country, I think. In most the developed yeah. country. Vixit Bharat, that's right. Yeah. The altern so that's the BJP vision. The alternative have been a set of guarantees. One of them has been to tell every young person that we are going to make sure that if you graduate with a degree in some of something or the other, you are going to be guaranteed a job. Now, this means a lot because we must remember that in 2014, when Mr. Modi was elected for the first time, he had promised this. You know, he had that very catchy slogan called Achhe Din, good times are coming. He had said that he was going to create employment and a lot of people believed him because India needs about a million jobs a month. And that's the scale of the problem. These are the kind of promises that are being made now. There's also an, an attendant set of issues which has really grown in the last five years, which is about welfare, whether people are recipients. Lab Bharti is the mm. term that has been thrown about, that somehow people are passive recipients rather than citizens with rights. There's a whole set of rights in India, right to food, right to education, right, right. to information. But the language of rights has been displaced by a language of being a passive recipient. Yeah. Of the leader's munificence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we're not even talked about the crisis in agriculture and in farming. We've had unprecedented return to land in terms of employment. We've had a decline in the female, uh, you know, labor, labor participation, participation rate. Right. Uh, so, yeah, the, quite a number of uh, crises which any next government can't afford to push under the carpet. Great. Thank you for that. As the largest democracy in the world, India's upcoming elections have always been a formidable logistical challenge. 
But in 2024, there have been some concerns about their conduct. Mukalika, could you summarize these concerns for our listeners? Yeah, the Election Commission of India is a constitutionally authorized body. Right? Its power derives from the constitution, not from the government. This is very different to a lot of Western democracies, for instance, and indeed others. So the confidence in the Election Commission of India, especially in re- recent decades, has been very high. In survey after survey, it's been the most respected public institution. And it is an extraordinary human exercise. It's the largest such event in the world by far. A sixth of the world's population goes to the polls. So it is massive. And the Election Commission has been quite exemplary in how it has conducted elections. And it's the reason why there were such high levels of trust is because it, it's maintained its neutrality very firmly. Right? There is a model code of conduct that kicks in the moment the elections are declared. The dates are announced, a model code of conduct, and there is a whole series of things that governments can't do and political parties can't do. You can't announce new schemes and so on. But there is also very severe censure on the quality of your speeches, hate speeches, censured immediately, you're fined, you're banned from campaigning for a few days. So there have been checks and balances in the conduct of elections. Now, unfortunately, and very sadly for India, that tremendous capital that India had on how it conducted its elections such that countries sought its advice repeatedly, that has been compromised for the following reasons. One is the appointment of the election commissioners, which used to be done by a bipartisan party, including the Chief Justice of India, has been reconstituted by law, and now it is appointed by the government, the three chief election commissioners. Number two, in 2017, a very retrograde mechanism of campaign finance was introduced, which were called electoral bonds, which basically made campaign finance totally opaque. So nobody but the State Bank of India knew which corporate house or which donor was giving money to which party. And the State Bank of India, knowing this, basically meant the government of India knew this, i.e. the ruling party knew this. And in March 2024, just a couple of months ago, the Supreme Court finally ruled on the electoral bonds and said this was unconstitutional. And the State Bank of India was asked to release the figures, and it refused for several days, defying the Supreme Court of India, and finally had to, and even today they've said they can't release the information yet, they were trying to kick it in the long grass by saying we'll do it in June, and so on. So campaign finances become opaque. And there is a real climate of nervousness and fear amongst donors, po- possible donors to political parties. People just don't talk. It's I, Unless you are in India, you don't realize just how fearful people are about opening their mouths. Because while I was saying earlier, the central agencies like the Enforcement Directorate has become, basically, it's, it's, an, it's become an extortion racket. So if you are seen not to have given money to the BJP, the enforcement direct shows up. You next day buy a few electoral bonds of a few million, uh, give it in, and they disappear. This has now been recorded over and over again by the journalists who are still doing their work. Uh, Not most of them aren't, but there still is an independent media that works incredibly hard. So these are the reasons why, and through this campaign, unfortunately, again, and I've been watching election campaigns for several decades now. The quality, one has to note this really, the quality of utterance in public life has plummeted. The language that is being used in demonizing Muslims, in lies, the number of lies that are being told on a daily basis at vast public gatherings and amplified through a media that is entirely sold out It's really quite extraordinary, Bala. I don't think I, in my life, I certainly haven't seen anything and and everybody agrees that this is the case. So to have the prime minister of a country just produce untruth after untruth is really, it's an experience India hasn't had before. But something we're seeing in other countries, though, Indeed. on a common basis. Totally. And just to add to that, we've had a couple of unprecedented developments just before these elections. The chief minister of a state who in Delhi, in yeah. Delhi and in Chhattisgarh being uh, jailed a few weeks before the elections or in the case of Kejriwal, probably 
almost the same day as the elections were announced. And the main opposition party, the Congress, having its uh, accounts frozen, frozen on, uh, for reasons of income tax non-compliance going back many years. And a couple of other things like this. So, uh, yes, the, you know, these elections, we are in totally new uncharted territory at almost every level. That's probably a very good follow-up to the next series of questions, which is let's talk about how to understand Modi and, and his appeal in a broader context. And Bala, my, my question is to you, M Modi is one example of strongman politics, among others. How much of his appeal can be understood as part of a global trend, when we're just talking about, and how much is it specific to India? I think it's a bit of both. And in a way, I think India exemplifies a much wider trend, though the demographics may not be identical across countries. Basically, Modi and the nation have become screens on which young people are projecting their aspirations. Mm -hmm. And the discourse of the nation and the discourse of strong men like Modi is, in fact, to do something to shape those aspirations. What is essentially happening is that the narrative of a strong India is something that the BJP and Modi in particular want to project. Now, India would have been strong in almost any situation, given its demographics, given yeah. its other strengths and so on. Uh, but we are now at a point, if I may say so, where the strong man ends up becoming the mascot of a strong nation. You know, a long time ago, there was a headline in the Indian newspapers about some action leading to an explosion of self-esteem. Right? And that is something that we are seeing over and over again. And there is a tendency to represent Modi and for Modi to represent himself as the embodiment of this uh, self-esteem. And this is not peculiar to India, though possibly the trend started in India, you know, make America great again. I mean, yeah. Trump. Yeah. A part of this is also that this kind of uh, such strong men also feed on the sense of impunity that there are no checks and balances, they can't be stopped, they set the agenda, and they make the rules. So Trump's famous statement about, I can walk down Fifth Avenue and kill somebody, and no one can do anything about it, exemplifies that kind of impunity. And then nations begin to act in that manner of impunity. Again, the US is there to you know, show the path to other aspiring powers. So we have a very complex kind of a, a melange here of uh, strong men speaking for strong countries and reinforcing this narrative mutually. The irony is that, exactly as Bala says, there is this narrative that has been constructed. And yet, at the same time, China now occupies several hundred kilometers of Indian sovereign territory. I, and India is not yeah. able to push back and defend or even criticize or even talk about it. So the mismatch between what is actually happening and what is being said, which is always an aspect of politics everywhere, mm -hmm. but the mismatch at the moment is of a really vast scale. And it is evident for anyone who is looking at the facts on the ground that there is this disconnect. But it has to be said that having just been in India and talking to all kinds of voters, people who admire Mr. Modi admire him without reservation because they really do feel strengthened by self-assertion. And exactly as Bala says, they feel the Indian passport is now the, one of the most valued passports in the world. This has no bearing on reality, but people genuinely believe that. And it nice. is quite extraordinary how one person has been able to build up that sense of hubris in so many million people. It is an interesting phenomenon. That pride, that sense of pride is extremely powerful. This is what we're seeing a lot in the US as well with the whole Make America Great Again. Thank you for that. Final question, and I'd like to offer this question to Mukalika. So India's presence in the world is also rooted in its large diaspora. In your view, how can this diaspora influence the elections? The ruling party in India has been exceptionally good in mobilizing people in the diaspora who support its politics. You know, it's institutional. So the RSS, which is the ide ideological arm of the BJP, and it's a hundred-year-old organization working on its cultural project of Hindutva, as it's called, uh, of imagining India as a Hindu nation. They have an overseas organization called the VHP. There are 
membership groups, there are organizations, there's fundraising, people go to campaign, they give money. It's a very organically networked organism. So the diaspora has been very connected. This is also a diaspora, a section of the diaspora that's wealthy, that has been able to give a lot of money. And increasingly, especially in the UK and the United States, have been politically more and more empowered, not least because they've been financially supported by the same right-wing organizations connected to India. So people of Indian origin in many places have been entering politics. So the nexus of politics and business amongst the diaspora has been growing and that influence. And this has led to also a huge prominence to this lobby. So there has been a perception that the Indian diaspora mostly supports the BJP. Recently, in the last few years, and very recently in the last two months, surveys have been done more systematically amongst the diaspora to just gauge what people under conditions of anonymity would say. And there are very interesting trends there where uh, recently, a very recent survey shows that actually India's image of the global superpower, a large number of people disagree with that assessment. They don't think that is the case. They live in the West. They, They don't think that is indeed what is happening. There is an interesting generational shift where younger people are both politically progressive but also socially progressive in a way that their parents' generation have tend to be socially conservative but politically progressive. So the data from the United States and the UK is is very interesting. We haven't, I haven't seen one on Europe yet. So the diaspora is probably more complex. And remember, the biggest section of the Indian diaspora is probably in the Middle East, the working class of the Middle East making that engine run. And they are not one that we think about when we think about the Indian diaspora. We're thinking of the more wealthy sections. So I think we need a lot more of what the Indian diaspora actually is and go beyond the noise. Right. Bala, any points on that? I totally agree. But just the way the BJP is mobilizing the diaspora and presents its endorsement by the diaspora as the endorsement of the world is in itself quite interesting. But to be fair, I think there has been actually remarkably little criticism of falling democratic standards in India from the West. And that's absolutely rooted in global foreign policy. And whether if you need an anti-China alliance, you really have to look the other way. If so, the people with the biggest stake in maintaining India's republic and its democratic credentials are Indians themselves. Right. They cannot. It's not for the rest of the world to decide because they're not going to. This is about a different set of dynamics. And that lack of criticism is seen to be an endorsement of what's happening. So the people, I think there is a real sense and within India and amongst the diaspora on camera saying we've had enough of hate and we, we are fed up of a country that is being polarized around a language of hate. We want to live in a different kind of country. This is not India. And as we mark 75 years of Indian democracy, it and as a scholar of democracy, I think it this election is really a test of India's maturity as a democracy. If you have been a pretty vibrant democracy for so long and its voters have experienced what democracy feels like, maybe, you know, an election is the occasion where you take a call on what you want to preserve and, and what you're willing to let go. I think that's a great way to end this episode. Thank you, Mukulika. Thank you, Bala, for joining us for this episode. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks, Mukulika.